So, <clears throat> um, hello everybody. Uh, so, um, I'm going to talk about systematic jump risk today. Um, let me just move this thing a little bit. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, before I start, this is joint work with, uh, with, uh, with Jean Jacot and, and my student Hui Di Lin, uh, who already graduated and went into the private sector, um, probably using this. Is this recorded now or not? Okay. It is, okay. Ah, <laughs> we should, okay, anyways. So, uh, no comments then. Um, about that. Um, so this is about systematic jump risk. So it is related in a way to the previous talk because it will be about pricing risk and pricing kernels, but uh, there will be a little bit more emphasis on the econometric side here, uh, which, uh, uh, which I will spend time. Uh, and so, so what is this about? I mean, I think the title should be relatively informative. Uh, um, I particularly have worked a lot in the past on jump risk, and a lot of uh, um, and a lot of our attention has been how to measure that risk from from returns, from just observing the realization of that jump risk. Uh, so we have um, many methods have been developed and testing procedures and you know and things like that. But somehow, um, in my mind, the the relationship to the pricing asset pricing has been missing from this literature to a large degree. Well. Not quite, but you know. Uh, so we've been we spend a lot of time on how to measure things, and so and ultimately, when you think about it, this jump risk, it's intuitive. It should matter for uh, for for people because it's kind of it just makes large moves hard to hedge. Um, but what we should really care about is the systematic component, in other words, the piece which we cannot uh, diversify away. And um, and so there's been much less work on this actually on this systematic jump piece. And that's what I'm going to focus on here, try to measure that, uh, that, that, that piece. And so I will define what I mean by uh, systematic jump risk, but as you can imagine, it's intuitive definition, will be that basically any cross-sectional clustering of jumps, basically for me, that's a systematic jump risk. That is something that you cannot diversify uh, away, okay? And um, that causes systematic risk, but then, Okay, so one thing which we can think, okay, well, I mean, um, we have factor models, which we use in asset pricing. So you can say maybe the basically just look at the factors and whether they jump and that's kind of a systematic jump risk. And that certainly is a systematic jump risk. Uh, and in particular, if you look at the market portfolio, it jumps a lot. And there's, I look at the option data, I presented yesterday, uh, some evidence that you actually, we know that there is they, a compensation for that type of uh, uh, that type of risk. But then, is that it, right? Is there something else left out there? Meaning, are there periods in which stocks actually co-move by big big moves, uh, which we are not capturing, or which our common risk factors are actually not capturing? And so that's what I'm going to be after. And the answer to that question will be surprisingly yes. There is a lot left on the table. Uh, and so what, that's what we will be after. And I will try to do that in a general setting uh, without actually imposing factor structure to begin with, okay? So we will try to detect that systematic jump risk in, a, in the cross-section of asset prices without imposing the existence of factor structure uh, in, in, in this, okay? And, uh, and then of course you can ask yourself, okay, so once you detect it, does it matter for asset pricing? You think it should because it's a systematic in nature type risk, and that's what we will be basically uh, after. I will try to kind of uh, I do a little bit, unfortunately, with this, and this is in the last piece here. There's much more, of course, to be done and to understand, but so I will nevertheless show you that it does matter for for asset pricing. Okay, so uh, so let me just uh, notations and definitions that are outline. Okay. So let me start then with, uh, instead of just spending, explaining what I'm going to do, let me show you. Uh, I'll try to keep the notation uh, kind of uh, minimally complicated, but uh, uh, so we will have a cross-section of assets. They will be uh, enumerated by J, and this is the X, X is the log price, okay, uh, at time T, and it will involve in this, in this 
continuous according to this continuous time model. So uh, the things which are yeah. So you have a, the drift term, and then you have a bunch of systematic normal type risks. Okay, and so as you can see, uh, why are they system? Why I'm calling them systematic? It's because uh, it's the same shock W, which is basically uh, and this assets load on this uh, on this set of shocks. Okay, um, so a finite number of factors. They, they are, I will going to treat them as latent. I don't need to actually take a stand. They are not observ necessarily observable factors. And then the piece which I'm be interested in in this in this work is actually that third piece here, which is basically this component here. So uh, let me spend a little bit of time explaining the notation. But if you were here yesterday, uh, that should be somewhat familiar uh, because I use the same notation. So mu is a measure which counts the realization of jumps over uh, over time dt and of size dz okay so you just you go through and you just you just count how many realizations you had of those now what makes this thing systematic is the fact that mu doesn't depend on j so the loading or the size of each of the for each asset j can be different but it takes place at the same point in time right so so there is a common arrival there something arrives and basically, and assets can react in, 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 in different ways, basically. And that, and that, that their response is given by this, uh, by this uh, delta J, okay? And then you have idiosyncratic risk. I will define it on the next slide. But from a, from a, a, theoretical, from a theoretical perspective, what we will, to call, to call this basically here, the, these events here, systematic events, what I would, what I would need to have is, uh, or I will assume that basically a non-trivial number of assets are impacted by, this, uh, by these events, right? So in other words, if I, if I sum the squares of those reactions of the stocks at these systematic events, basically, and I take the limit of this cross-sectional limit as the number of stocks goes to infinity, is basically you have, uh, this is strictly positive. So all that is saying is just basically you have a non-trivial number of assets which are impacted by the shock. And so that's for us, as soon as we have, so there's something happens and a non-trivial number of stocks react to that, that's basically a systematic jump event. So that's what we will call uh, systematic jump risk. And what we are trying to do, we'll basically try to do uh, is to measure that piece from the, from the data. In many, so the way people have thought about systematic jump risk till now is that you say, okay, there's some set of factors which are, we know are systematic, and then there basically you look at how stocks react to, to, to those uh, uh, at those times of this when some, some of these factors uh, jump, and that's basically what systematic jump is. But you might also imagine situations when we don't have this type of factor structure, and that's what I'm going to be. Uh, uh, after. And so I will define also the idiosyncratic risk on the next slide, but that's kind of uh, not surprising. So you can have a two, a two components. One is basically the normal type of idiosyncratic risk, which is uh, these guys here, and then you have the, the jumpy part, which is uh, basically, you see it's represented in a similar way, it's just L is for the, some kind of a jump type process, and this is uh, a, a Brownian motion. And so, and the important thing here is that they have, each of those shocks here have, of course, subscript J, which means that, uh, well, and I assume that those, those, those driving processes here, they are independent, basically, okay, uh, across J's. And so that means that basically if I take the difference, uh, if I take the sample average of those, you can wash out this risk, right? It becomes basically the, the cross-sectional average converges to, um, converges to zero, okay. So that's, that's what we have. So this is the setup. Uh, so, okay, so let me just go back. Okay, so this is the setup. We have a set of stocks. There's some systematic events. We don't know when they happen. We don't, uh, but we, we are afraid of those and basically we wanna detect those. And what I'm going to try to do now is design a procedure in which we can get them from the, from the returns, just observing a, a large cross-section of stocks at a high frequency and will design a procedure basically to identify what are these kind of uh, uh, systematic jump events. So that's in a nutshell what we were going to be uh, doing here. 
Okay, so how do we do that? I mean, one, one way, I mean, you might say, so, okay, so if you are, uh, uh, I assume not many of you have been doing this and uh, dealing with high frequency uh, financial data, but if you had, uh, then you will know that there's one classical way, if you're looking at one uh, univariate series, the way you separate jumps is very intuitive. You just look, if the return, uh, if we're sampling at very high frequency, basically you're just looking at if the return is big or not, okay? And what is big and what is not big is relative to how big should be the return if there were no jumps. And then you basically, that thing is, you know that an increment of a Brownian motion if a, is of a size, if the length of the interval is delta, it's approximately a size square root of delta, okay? And so basically you pick a threshold which is slightly bigger than that, so you see delta is going down to zero because you're sampling more frequently. And so you pick a threshold like that, and then you say, if the return, if I observe a return that is more than three standard deviations, so that's very unlikely to be happening from a diffusive piece, and then that's basically, we label that thing as a jump. So that's in a nutshell what people have, uh, what we have done uh, uh, in this literature, it's pretty intuitive. And now you can say, well, I mean, if I can do it this way, can't I just identify this systematic jump events by going through each individual asset and basically labeling the returns, okay, well, at this point, something happens. So if there is a systematic jump event, you would expect that this truncation procedure uh, should basically pick up, I should, I should, the systematic jump should basically trigger jumps, I should identify rather, the, the jump time in many, uh, in many stocks at the same time, and that's basically should be, this, as I should label that thing as a systematic jump event. Now, that's not going to work, and it's very intuitive why it's not going to work, because um, uh, you have so much idiosyncratic risk that basically that, uh, that's essentially the only way, basically what you can pick up from, if you're just looking at individual stocks, what you will be picking up is really, really gigantic jumps and everything else is just washed, kind of, it's, 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 it's blurred with, with all the idiosyncratic risk which is out there. Um, and so, what instead we need to do basically is a procedure where somehow we can integrate out or wash out or average out, if you want to call it this way, the, the, the idiosyncratic risk and make the, the systematic piece more, basically, more visible. So that's, um, and so we are going to uh, implement, so this is type of procedure that we are going to uh, develop. And um, so, so here's the, here's in a nutshell the idea, of, or our idea of how to do that. And basically we, we will build on two, on two things. First is, if you look at, uh, if you look at, uh, if you look at the, uh, how, how to separate a diffusive piece or uh, kind of a, the normal type of risk from a jump risk, is uh, you go for higher moments. So uh, if you look at, that's where the jump stands out, right? Um, if you look at the, if you look at the increment over short interval time of a Brownian motion, and you take advantage that if you raise it to a high power, basically this piece becomes, you see, I mean, delta is something which is small, and then the higher the power, the higher the, 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 higher the power here, the smaller this piece becomes on average. Of course, on, everything is on average. If you look at the jump, that's the thing that the jump is, once it arrives, no matter, you can raise it to many, as many powers you want, you're not going to make it small, okay? And so basically that, that's how, you know, like uh, I did this type of ideas, of course, have been used also in some of our detection procedures for jumps as well, alternative uh, procedures to the one I just described. So basically use higher moments, and the jumps should stay higher, okay? And then the second idea that we need to use here, if we are after systematic type jump events, is that just take advantage of cross-sectional averaging. If I take advantage of cross-sectional averaging, basically what will happen here is that uh, I take cross-sectional averages and the idiosyncratic risk, even if it's a jump risk, is going to become small, okay? Uh, and this just in our, in my notation here, this is the systematic jumps which I don't observe, and I want to detect, you cross-sectionally average them, it is something that is not going to shrink to zero. And then you take the cross-sectional average of idiosyncratic shocks, this thing is going to actually shrink, even though they are, you know, they are still big, but, but they just don't happen, at the, uh, 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 they don't happen for many assets, and as a result, you can kind of average out or their importance 
will be actually uh, uh, diminished in the, in the cross-sectional averaging. So I'm going to basically use those two, I'll build on those two ideas to develop a procedure to just uh, uh, to detect the systematic jump risk. And so here, here is the idea and here is the procedure now. Uh, before that, uh, let me tell you what I'm using as an input, but although it should be uh, should be clear by now. So we are using high frequency returns, but uh, uh, this is my notation. This is just more for the notation. This is my notation of the high frequency increment. So this is, because these are log prices, this is a return, okay? Uh, and this is the return of an asset J over that small interval of time, which is a flank delta N, okay? And everything we do here will be well, we are thinking of an asymptotic experiment in which we are sampling more frequently, so n is going to infinity, and that just means that basically the, the gap between observations is getting smaller and smaller, and the number of the number of stocks we are looking at is going to infinity. So it's a it's a panel, it's a high frequency basically a return panel in which both dimensions of the panel are increasing. Okay, so it's that joint asymptotic setting. Okay, and to detect what I'm, I was going, uh, I was talking about the systematic jump event. So what we were going to do is we are, it's a very simple statistic and basically uh, we will use, we will just at each point in time, I will cross-sectionally average um, transformations of the returns of this form. G is a general function, but for the purposes of here, it's probably better just to think of the squared function. So in other words, what this statistic, which I call AG for aggregate, okay, is a, a cross-sectional realized variance or cross-sectional uh, variance, uh, uh, cross-sectional average uh, variance uh, across all assets. So at this point in time, I sit, I calculate the cross-sectional average of the return squared, okay? And I look at this statistic, and now if we go a little bit deeper in this statistic and decompose it, uh, and and here how you will see how what what the uh, whether how the jump risk will become clear or kind of will emerge will be identified from it. So if you uh, decompose it, okay, it's a squared, so it's a very not a very difficult calculation. So you will have basically one piece. The piece which I'm after ultimately is this systematic jump event piece, which is the sum of the squared systematic jumps. I don't observe that thing, right? It's hidden. It's in, the, in this aggregate statistic, but among many other things, okay? But the, anyways, if there was a jump, basically systematic jump, this thing is not small. It's a further OP1. It's not shrinking, okay? And then, of course, I have the squared systematic diffusive factors, the normal factors. Now, okay, the sum of those. Now, this thing is shrinking as I sample more frequently. So it's of order of magnitude, basically delta n. So it's shrinking. If I'm having finite, finite sample data, I basically uh, it's going to shrink, okay? Then you have some cross product terms which drive the CLT uh, results for later on, which is not important. They are high order terms. And then you have the average idiosyncratic variance, basically coming from jumps and coming from diffusive moves from anything. And so now, again, this thing is not it's of order of magnitude just like the systematic diffusive risk. It's shrinking, but you see it's shrinking only with the delta. It's not, it doesn't depend on the big N, on the, on the, on the size of the cross-section. And finally, you have some residual terms which are much, much smaller, and so we don't need to uh, uh, bother. And so what I want to do is I want to use this statistic, which is something observable, to measure this thing, which is the systematic jump events. But, you know, it's the leading term, but there's these guys which are actually uh, non-trivial. And so how do we do this? Well, basically what you, what you should take advantage of is that this piece here, so what is, so if you just look at the idiosyncratic risk, what is this piece basically is the average idiosyncratic variance, okay? Well, average idiosyncratic variance is not going to change from one period to the other. For if I'm looking over five minutes, volatility stays approximately constant. And so why don't I difference basically I take a difference of two measures like this, aggregate measures like this, over two consecutive intervals. And then basically, essentially to a large degree, this idiosyncratic piece will be washed out. Okay. And so, and so that's, the, and that, that's the idea. So this is what I'm, I'm showing you here on this slide, that this, usually the, the average idiosyncratic volatility over idiosyncratic volatility over short intervals of time, over two consecutive five minutes, 
let's say, uh, to be specific here, it's not going to change much. It's, it's changing, but it's kind of a, that is really a trivial change. And so, basically, that means that what I have to do is I can just build my statistic or detector from, from, this, uh, from these differences. So I compute aggregate average, cross-sectional average squared returns over, over five-minute returns, over five-minute periods, and then look at the difference of those consecutive, the first order difference of those. And whenever something big happens, that basically, that means that there was a systematic jump event. That's the, that's the idea. And uh, here's the statistic formally defined. So you, you, you basically, you look at the, you look at the, you look at these consecutive differences of these cross-sectional averages, you square it, you normalize it by one half, and, and that's it. And what this thing builds on the idea is that if I'm sampling frequently enough, okay, um, a jump can happen only in one of those increments. So uh, uh, if it happens in increment i, it's not going to happen in increment i minus one with a high probability, right? Because by their definition, these are rare events. So they're not going to happen over consecutive five minute intervals. And so I'll be able to separate this way, the systematic, uh, systematic jump. And so, and that's how basically, and that's how we will build our detectors of systematic uh, jump risk. And I think the, 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 the statistic is pretty intuitive, what it's doing. So you're looking at higher order moments so that you separate systematic, for, uh, sorry, diffusive from uh, a jump risk. And you're taking, you're doing the cross-sectional averaging, so you're separating idiosyncratic risk from, um, uh, from systematic risk. Okay. Uh, formally, you can basically show that uh, this statistic, which we call C SJ for systematic jumps, is going to basically pick up all of these systematic jump events. Uh, and uh, it will converge to basically what is the cross-section, so it's the cross-sectional average or the expected cross, uh, the, the expected jump, uh, uh, systematic jump, basically. Uh, uh, this is a random number, uh, so, uh, how am I doing with time? So how much in detail can I go? <laughs> the chair is a little bit uh, I, I, I distracted. Know, I remember earlier, you started at 8, so... Um, we started at 8? No, you started at, so you have till about 11.05. 11.05? No, no, you, no you, are, you are off. No, no, you are off. No. Yeah. Well, we were, we were delayed, remember? Yeah, if I stand... Ten, that cuts into the... 10.53 then. I think it's 1053. Um, yeah, uh, no, 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 1008. Let's make it 11. Yeah. Yeah. Shy, of 11. Shy of 11. Okay. <laughs> All right. So then I can torture you more. Okay. So, so, so okay. Uh, good. Um, so, all right. So, well, well, so then what you see basically is that this, this, uh, this statistic, the systematic jumps, converges to, the, uh, to what we basically. What you're looking at is identify the systematic jump events, and then you cross-sectionally average them. And uh, what you converge to is the average, basically, uh, expected uh, uh, jump size um, in the cross-section. Now, this can be a random number. And so basically, what I'm, and so that, and this looks very mysterious the way I'm, I've written it here. C stands for the common information set. Basically, anything which is systematic in nature, it enters in this information set C, okay? And, uh, and basically, and so let me give you one example because I think that it's a little bit... Ten fifty, new time, ten fifty. I better speed up now, okay. So, <laughs> no, 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 don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. Okay, so let me give you an example because this is uh, this sounds very mysterious. Uh, uh, so, so what what this limit is and it should not be. So, if you're thinking of a, if you're thinking of a factor model, okay, and then uh, you have uh, this is the factor size, okay, and epsilon. Uh, really, that was not a very smart notation, but it's like the loading. So it should have been maybe better would have been a better notation, okay, for that. But the idea is that if this thing is cross sectionally IID, so what this thing is converging to is you see this thing is common across all the systematic jumps and that thing when you cross-sectionally average it you will average it to a constant okay and that's basically what so so think about it this is like the average better of the of the of the stock 
and that's just the, the, the something, and that thing here is something random, which is basically the factorialization. Okay, that's basically what that that thing uh, uh, will capture. Now, what I can do also, and and uh, the way I motivated this thing I started off with is uh, well. Um, you know, I want to see the systematic jump risk, which is not spanned by factors which we typically observe, right? So if I thought that the systematic jump risk is all coming from factors, then what observable factors, then that, that's kind of what I'm doing here is silly because I can just observe the factors where they don't have idiosyncratic risk and identify the jumps, their times of uh, jump arrivals. So, of course, uh, so those are obvious. And so if I look at the market portfolio, if I look at the Fama French factors, I can look at the times this, uh, this factor is jump. I'm not interested in those. What my interest is uh, is in whether there are some events which are not in those, uh, in those factors which are observable and which I can just go and pick up and identify. And so that's why I basically, I can identify the times when these factors jump observable factors if you want, and I can remove them from the analysis, okay? And that's what I'm going to do and see whether there's something else left, okay? So technically, okay, this is a technicality, but given the new time uh, I have, so I, maybe I should, uh, I should basically skip that. It's just saying that if you know that you can, with probability one, identify the times of the factors jump, you can just uh, remove them from the analysis and have it, you can go on as if you knew when the factors uh, jumped. Okay. So here's a first plot for, for this talk uh, uh, where basically uh, we did this on the data. So we calculated this. I mean, this statistic is very easy to, to calculate, obviously, and it's a very intuitive statistic. You just calculate average cross-sectional averages of variances. Uh, you difference them and square them and that's it. Um, and then what I did is I compared, uh, so what we compare here, we compare this statistic uh, with just the market variance, just to see uh, how is that, just in terms of just time series properties. So there is this systematic jump risk, which is not driven by the common factors we have, we use, uh, and how does it relate to, uh, so when is it big and when is it small and things like this. And so uh, what I did, what you see here plotted is this, the blue line is basically this, uh, my, the statistic for this systematic non-factor jump risk, okay? Uh, and the red line is, I compare it against the market realized variance. So just look at the market variance over time. And so um, they are rescaled so that they have the same mean, okay? So it's easier to compare apples to apples. Uh, they're in the same units, volatility units. Um, and what you see is that basically this risk, the, 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 the new risk, systematic risk we're identifying, it's large, but it's not large or it's not as large, it's not as extreme in the times when the market is basically jumping up, right? So, uh, which is the, the, the periods of the financial crisis, of course, hit the market big, not as much this non-market systematic jump risk. So in some sense, this is not totally trivial. It, it doesn't need to happen this way, but that's how it happens. And you have a lot of periods in which this non-market systematic jump risk is present, for example, in this relatively quiet periods of 2004, 2008, when that basically thing is elevated, well, it's just nothing. The market, the aggregate market was very uh, quiet. And you have a lot of other periods like this. So that's kind of, it's a more stable thing, if you want, with less dispersion, uh, uh, what we identify. Okay. All right. So um, now, um, uh, this is for the econometricians in the room. Uh, there are a few of them, so, uh, so maybe I should go through that. But so basically, you can. Um, but well, that's kind of fun to do uh, because it's not. Uh, it's different from the uh, from the the traditional type of asymptotics you develop for uh, in high frequency data because you have these two dimensions now of the panel. Uh, and so um, I don't want to spend too much time about uh, uh, on that, but just to say what. The, uh, what's driving basically the behavior of this or the error, the leading term, there are two components of uh, error which mask or which, which prevent us from seeing the systematic jump risk, which matter. And these leading components are two. So the, uh, the one, which is here, it's driven by um, cross-sectional variation in jump risk, okay? Um, and, uh, and, 
so actually but probably this is not quite uh, cross-sectional variation of idiosyncratic jump risk is what I have to say. So, so around the systematic jump time, the, the, just the variation, the presence of idiosyncratic jumps is going to mask our, a little bit or prevent us from seeing fully the systematic jump. So that's basically what this thing is going to be driven by. And then also the systematic diffusive risk around the jumps is going to make things difficult to, to see. So they will depend. So the one, the first piece here, will depend on how large the cross-section is, so the big N, while the second piece will depend on how frequently we sample the data. So they, they kind of, a, uh, and that's why we have here, the, you're looking at uh, basically the two dimensions of the panel will matter uh, for, identifying the, uh, uh, for identifying the systematic jump risk. Okay, and so anyways, the, the variances are described here, so I don't need to probably uh, uh, spend too much time on that. They are what they are. It's, 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 okay, so they're not that difficult to compute. Uh, and so I'll skip that. And so now what I will go, so okay, so once I know, basically, I can aggregate the cross-sectionally the data and I can identify the times when they systematic jump, jumps, which are not factor, uh, driven by fact, common factors. So there's something there. Now you want to probably try to a little bit learn or try to understand better uh, what's driving or, 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 or well, and the first thing probably is just to see, just like when we uh, try to measure factor exposure, right? Uh, and so, but in this, in, the, in this context, right? So that's, that's one thing. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is going, I'm going to do, uh, so, uh, so, um, so I'm going to define this statistic CJ. Uh, so uh, the first one was, uh, um, Systematic jumps and this, I don't know what C now stands for, I forgot how, how we thought about this, but it's basically the exposure. This thing is aimed to, to capture the, how the stock J reacts to how the stock, well, okay. So how the stock J, why did I go? Uh, ah, okay, yeah, how the stock J uh, reacts to when, uh, when there is this, uh, uh, when there is this systematic, uh, systematic jump event happening, okay? So as you see, what it com this thing converges to is the reaction of the stock to its across product, okay? Um, so, um, well, what you can notice also is that everything is in squares, and so that's not by any means the only measure of exposure to systematic jump risk because you're losing the sign, and so if you're interested in the level of returns, the cross-section of expected returns, that's not going to be good. But for what I'm going to show you as an application where I will go to variance risk, that actually is going to be enough for, for what I'm going to do, okay? Uh, for the other thing, we can discuss. Uh, the, well, well, they still basically, there's work to be done and probably something like a version of PCA type analysis will be probably uh, necessary. I'll skip the CLT for this because it's, uh, but just to say, again, to kind of, to connect things and just not to think that this is so super kind of strange or weird uh, um, uh, and abstract, is to just think about a factor model again. So if, if, the, if we were in a one factor setting, I'll have this systematic jump event. This is my factor exposure, beta j, and this is the size of the, 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 this factor which is latent, okay? And then what my statistics cj, I, I scale it by the sj, the, the, the systematic jump risk statistic, Basically, it's going to pick, uh, pick up the, the factor exposure squared. It's just, so I'm losing the sign, okay, in doing that, all right? But again, if I'm, if I'm going to focus on variance risk, as I'm going to do in the application, that's, uh, that's enough, okay? All right, so, and then we did this. So just to see, basically, what do we get? Do we get something which looks very different from the, the common, you know, exposures we see? And so we decided, just uh, 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 this is just just for to see how things look. Uh, uh, I'm not I'm not going to use directly this thing in the pricing exercise. Um, and so what we did is we basically we computed these exposures to that latent systematic jump events, which are not a factor a factor jumps. Okay, and then we decided to aggregate those betas so or those beta squares across uh, uh, stocks in different sectors, just to, just to see some kind of a, uh, more aggregate patterns in this. And this is what you see here, and I plot it against the, the market betas of these uh, stocks. And so 
And the point of this plot is to show that actually you're getting something which is quite different in terms of cross-sectional uh, behavior uh, of the stocks. And so this is, again, by sectors, so the, fi the financial sector, the energy sector, and, and uh, uh, computers and technology, whatever you want to call that. Um, and, uh, and again, it's cross-sectionally averaged out. So of course, a lot of information which potentially is important for asset pricing is probably washed out this way. But nevertheless, even with this kind of coarse kind of aggregation, you do see a lot of different patterns which come from these uh, systematic exposures, right? So, uh, uh, so blue line here is this systematic jump risk sensitivity, which we call, and the red line is the market, okay? The market betas of these stocks. And I have to say market beta squared, okay? Because what I'm measuring is a beta squared, essentially. So to do the apples to apples. And uh, so that's why this probably looks a little bit uh, uh, noisy or vibrating a lot uh, uh, around. But you do see a lot of uh, uh, different uh, patterns showing up. For example, after the financial crisis, when the financial sector here, the market betas were kind of dipped down, you actually see that in this systematic non-market jump risk actually uh, it's still uh, heavily exposed uh, in this, uh, for example, uh, stocks are heavily exposed in this sector to that, uh, to that type of um, risk. All right, so um, with this, uh, now, um, a lot of the, this uh, high frequency literature has been dealing with the problem of how you test for, for this systematic jump risk. Basically, I can, I can measure this, but you can be also interested whether this thing is statistically different from zero, or it's just basically picking up uh, uh, garbage, okay? And so um, you can develop the test. It's a little bit trickier, and so I'm not going to spend time on that. I will just, in the interest of time, I will skip this. I will go to the application. Uh, I will just say that, you know, it's interesting to see what happens if there was no systematic jump. Actually, it turns out this thing is very, very small in size. Again, both dimensions of the panel is going to contribute to how big that thing is, but you can quantify this. You can use this to develop a test. So let's, uh, let's just skip that, blah, 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 okay. Test it, you detect it, okay. And uh, now let's do a little bit in the remaining time, a little bit of a, that's a very small empirical evidence, nothing compared to what we saw in the previous talk. Um, uh, but nevertheless, just to get some idea. So what we decided to do is uh, to implement all of this on a set of the 500, basically S&P 500, essentially. Um, okay, and the sample period is a 20 period, uh, 20 year period, not small. Uh, and uh, we used five, uh, five minute data. And then what we did is uh, we removed the three pharma French factors. You can remove the five pharma French factors, nothing will happen. Um, yeah, so we just got rid of those and so we identify, so basically all that means is that the times when these uh, factors jumped, I, I just erased them, okay? And, and then I detected from the remaining data, I detected the times when, using this statistic, the times when the systematic, uh, this, there's some evidence for systematic clustering, basically a cross-sectional clustering of, 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 of stocks, okay? And then, um, and then what I did with this, I measured each stock sensitivity to this type of event risk, okay? Systematic jump risk, okay? And uh, what I wanted to do is then I go to a place where the, the jumps are much clearer or their contribution is, is stronger. Uh, and, so, and the cross-section of returns is something to do. That's something we are working on uh, to, 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 to analyze the performance there or, or how much this matters, this systematic jump risk matters there. But something which is somewhat easier and uh, in the sense that because the jump risk is easier, kind of it's louder there, is to look at the variance risk premium, okay? Um, again, uh, we've been defining yesterday variance risk premiums or realized variance risk premium stuff, so I, uh, but uh, in, in any ways, what this thing is, is you look at the variance risk premium, it's just you look at the future return variance over a period, typically a month, and then you sub uh, and and basically uh, you compare the Q expectation and the P expectation, and that's basically the variance risk premium. Or in other words, is the compensation you wanna uh, basically the compensation demanded for for uh, for taking on this variance uh, variance risk. Okay, and as we know, 
uh, you can identify this, the, the price of that variance risk from the option data in this, this nice easy formula. Okay, and of course I can I cannot I don't want to build models con for conditional uh, expectation of variance risk in the future because this will be very model dependent. But what I will do, I will basically replace the 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 expected variance with the realized variance. And the thing is that the difference between the two is just a martingale term, so it should not matter. For what I uh, for what I do, okay, and so basically that means that I end up with the realized variance risk premium, which is uh, I look at the the Q expectation from the option data for each stock, and I subtract from it the realized variance risk over that period of time, okay, and so that's basically it's the variance risk premium plus the thing which I'm trying to measure plus a martingale difference sequence. It's not that different from the things which we do with the asset prices, right? We have the, the risk premium is a small piece and then you have a martingale term which is basically clouding uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of, is hiding it uh, for in the return, okay. And so what I wanna do is basically I wanna see whether in, if there was, if this systematic jump risk is priced, what I should see basically if this thing is different from zero, it should be in this piece here, okay? It should be in this piece here and um, and basically, if I simplify things to to the kind of to the, fa uh, the to the factor setting, and suppose that there was the the, the usual three factor model, uh, Fama French factor model, and uh, and then there is also this piece, which is this systematic non factor jump risk. Okay, well then I, what I should see is that the risk uh, um, the realized variance risk premium should be decomposed in this form. Uh, notice that these are, these are the squared betas because again I'm using uh, I'm working in the second moments, and uh, and uh, and the, the the piece in blue is actually the piece which I'm gonna uh, identify. I can measure those those betas towards this systematic jump risk by the procedures which I was just showing you right now. Uh, I will be finished in a in a minute. Um, so okay. And so what I can do, uh, you know, you can do the equivalent of Fama, uh, Fama Macbeth, or you can just do a sorting exercise. And what we did is, well, we did both, but what I will show you is the sorting. And uh, the sorting where I sort on those stocks and then high and low, okay? Look at the gap, sorting on the value of these betas, high and low, look at the gap, and then control for the exposure of the stocks to the, to the Fama French factors and see if there's something else uh, left. And what you see is basically the Fama, this is the, the I, I spare you the details here, but what you get is something which is basically rather, rather, rather large. Uh, uh, and that, that gap, basically you cannot just, the, the, when I sort essentially the stocks on this, the exposure to my systematic jump risk, which I identified, which is not a factor type jump risk. And I cannot justify the gap, which you see in the high and the low portfolio, with, um, with exposure to, to the traditional Fama French factors, which is basically telling you that we are picking up something which is not yet, which is not there in the, in the factors, okay? So I'll stop here. I mean, this is, of course, kind of, this evidence is rather preliminary and one needs to go deeper. And um, yeah. Yeah, Piotr? So, yeah, okay, uh, so, so well, I mean, the same way, uh, well, uh, I mean, think about the, uh, so the, the, we can say the same thing with the, with the market, right? So, so the, the type of, the type of, uh, the type of jump risk which I'm capturing here, which is not a market one, means that basically uh, there were a bunch of stocks which were going up and then a bunch of stocks which were going down and when you average them, it averages to zero or close to zero, right? That's the, basically the idea. And the same thing for this Fama French factors, right? So this risk is, something which is, uh, yeah, it kind of cancels out in the factors and it's not present there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, that's dangerous, but okay. <laughs> no, you don't, no, 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 you don't choose the fee. No, no, sorry, no, 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 because, no, oh, because you see, this is, Okay, that's a good, well, well, okay. So this is stated 
uh, this is infeasible the way it's stated. But when you implement it, actually, you don't know. You don't need to know the fee. You just uh, you just say, sorry. Yeah, uh, basically the way you do it, uh, uh, this fee is just this ratio, which is observable. So that your fee is proxied by this ratio, right? Which is observable. And little n and big n, these are, this is your numbers, right? How big is the cross section? How big is the sample in frequency? So that's, that, that's basically, there's no, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not doing justice to the theory, which is not good, because uh, actually this is what I got really excited about. But, uh, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, the feasible implementation, you don't need to know any of this kind of how big is the cross section. And the, the nice thing is, with, with basically this reminds me uh, something I overlooked. You don't need, for this, all of this, you don't need to say the typical thing which you have in, in panel data, where you have to say that one dimension grows at a faster rate or a slower rate. You don't need any of that. Actually, this works. You see, I include both the zero and the one is included. So you might have one dimension growing at a faster rate and, and the other one than the other one, and it still works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. But this is a, a fee is a limiting a fee is a limiting quantity. So I don't know what what do you mean by this? Yeah, that's a, that, that converges to some number which is zero somewhere between zero and one. So 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 yeah. 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 Very, very, very good, very good point. So you check something on the time range. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So very, that's a very good point. Um, so we did, we, we, to guard, and I'm very, very, very sensitive. We got to be careful with this because you're doing 500. And if somebody de got delayed, and uh, and then then of course you will get uh, you will get a delayed response. My uh, the thing which helps us a little bit here is that we are using a large cross section, and so it's not going to be so sensitive to a few basically having a delayed reaction. We did this thing actually with 10 minutes as well, 15 minutes. You get more or less the same the same answer, and uh, it's kind of nice. I mean, if you just think about the cross sectional averaging, these AGs where this aggregate cross-sectional variances which this thing builds on, they are supposed to be flat and they are most of the time flat. And it's kind of, you, you see it pop up and then, well, that's the time. There's something happened basically. Yeah. 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 So um, it's natural to wonder if that, if you start thinking about sector moments and death yeah. obviously. Yeah. And so I like the idea that you correct it with final strength, but I would argue Right. And so, ideally, it would be fair to loading at some point yeah. with, with the, with the yeah. market. I would like to see if it varies with the loading on RM square or on the variance. Right. And okay. Maybe ah. RM to the third. Yes. 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 So yeah, yeah. To, to give to. Previous to... paper actually. <laughs> that that's a good point. No, no, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I was uh, yeah. That's right. Uh, uh, that's right. Yeah. I will leave it to that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.